Hey, folks, today's episode is sponsored by HBO and the new anthology series Room 104, premiering July 28th at 1130 p.m. It comes from creators and executive producers Mark and Jay Duplass, and it's set in a single room of an average American motel, with each episode telling the story of different characters who pass through it. Each episode is like a different mini-movie, some comedy, some drama, some horror, with performances by James Vanderbeek, Jay Duplass, and Orlando Jones, with everything changing from one week to the next. One room, infinite possibilities. Room 104 premieres July 28th at 11.30 p.m. on HBO. Also, if you enjoy animated interdimensional murder, alien drug use, and testicle monsters in space, then let's do this, bro. Rick and Morty on Adult Swim. The critically acclaimed animated comedy series follows a sociopathic genius scientist, Rick, and his less intelligent grandson, Morty, who split their time between domestic family life and dangerous interdimensional adventures. Only a show this smart could be this stupid. Rick and Morty. All new episodes begin this Sunday at 1130 only on adult swim catch up now at adultswim.com all right let's do the show all right let's do this how are you what the fuckers what the fuck buddies what the fucking ears what the fucksters what the fuck, Adelics? What's happening? I'm Mark Marin. This is my podcast, WTF. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it. How's it going? Hey, you know, if it's, uh, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm recording this the day before. So uh, Thursday, if there's still time, as there is, call your senators. Call your senators. Email them. Do whatever you need to do to voice your disapproval of rushing this heinous, murderous, Health care repeal bill through Congress, through the Senate. Do it. You don't want to see your neighbors die because they can't uh, get health insurance or they lose the stuff they got. You just want to watch your neighbors and co-workers and friends or people that work for you or people you know just all of a sudden lose all hope because it's pulled out from under them. For what reason? For what reason? This is America. We should be the best. Not the fucking most embarrassing shit show circus on the planet. If anybody's feeling extraordinarily uh, excited and proud of what we're going through as a country right now, I don't know, man. I don't know what's up with you. I really don't. I know you probably don't like me, but man, man, where's your humanity? Where's your fucking class? Where's your dignity? Where's your national pride what a fucking shit show you just don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next and you don't know when it's going to be all over because all of a sudden it's not about the country anymore it's just about protecting a narcissistic spiteful lunatic who wants who does not give shit number one about the united states of america zero shits he gives all about himself. So you guys just keep being proud to protect him. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's what that. What, what's America all about? Oh, protecting a lunatic from himself. Great. Yeah. What a vision for the future. How's it going? Are you all right? We got a big show today. I'm not going to ramble on too much. I thought I'd just get, you know, give a chipper little nudge to stay active. And anybody who thinks it's not that it's a liberal or conservative issue, health care, you're, you're out of your mind. You think this is some sort of wrestling show that ends in the apocalypse. Yeah. The world's greatest heel. The last great heel. <laughs> yeah. I can't. I'm, I'm now, like, I see, like, right there. You felt that pause? Fell right down, fell right down the, the ditch, right down the rabbit hole. Of of horrendous darkness. It's always right there. It's like hovering beside you now. What's that next to you? Oh, that is a uh, that's. Uh, I thought that was an invisible tunnel to hell. No, no, no. It's not. We're all going through it. We're all. It's all the yeah. All of us. The entire world being sucked through a selfish tunnel to hell. Hey, but uh, if you're proud and excited, Godspeed. If you're terrified and angry. Speak up. 
Make those phone calls. Hit those streets. God damn. All right. On a lighter note, I uh, got an email here. Uh, subject line, you just got better without trying. Mark, a few days ago, I had a three-hour drive up north to run the San Francisco Marathon. I had a few unlistened to episodes of WTF on deck, but I wanted to save those for the marathon and decided to try another top-rated podcast through iTunes. It sucked. Tried another. It was boring. Tried a third. The guy was being overly dramatic for the subject matter. I've listened to most of your 800-plus episodes while running, and they helped the miles slip past. I've been growing concerned that you might hang it up soon because you're sounding a bit over it. If you stop, I may quit running and get fat. That's on your shoulders. Thanks for all of your effort, Soren. I'm not over the podcast. I'm a bit over almost everything, pal. I'm just trying to get by like the rest of you. But no, yeah, I'm not going to let you get fat, pal. And I wish I could apply that to me listening to podcast thing to uh, to me getting out and running. I'm exercising, I'm not running enough. But what you know what? Who... Who cares? Big show today. Can't ramble on too long. Got two guests. Got a shorty and a longie. Got Joe Mandy coming up, who I love. Joe Mandy, the very funny comedian. And then David Allen Greer, one of the funniest people alive, coming up. Joe Mandy has been on this show before, and he's a very funny guy, a very bright guy. I was happy that he came over. I like talking to Joe. Uh, he has a new stand-up special called Joe Mandy's Award-Winning Stand-Up Special that is now streaming on Netflix. And he stopped by here. He stopped by the garage to chat a little bit. This is me and the uh, the sharp and funny Joe Mandy. It's no place good, Joe. I don't uh, think so. <laughs> I mean, I'm doing great. That's what I'm dealing with right now. It's Me too. Like, I, it's, I, a, it's the the it's a hellscape everywhere, but like my it's immediate a, surroundings. Yeah, like, very. But you know, a little. It's probably a little. The the perimeter is probably bigger than just immediate surroundings. Yeah. But but if you are engaged and you are paying attention, uh, you 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 feel a little shitty about having a, uh, feeling okay about yourself. Yeah, yeah. But I always had that in my head though. Like I, I I've talked about that a bit on stage where. There's always been part of me, no matter how good things are, mm -hmm. which ha they haven't been this good for me personally ever. Uh -huh. But there's always part of me that wants to be like, nah, but it's still kind of fucked. Right. But now it's like it is. You know, it's not. I'm not making it up. No. It, it's kind of fucked. No, it's super fucked. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's like cartoonish. Scary. How evil. Yeah. Things so it's like it's like this is hack. Like if if someone pitched some of this stuff, I mean, yeah. this is too this is too much. But what are you, what have you been up to? You coming over on a Saturday? I assume you're writing somewhere. Yeah, I'm writing on a show called The Good Place right now um, it, on NBC. Oh wait, what? Who's in that? That's Kristen Bell and Ted Danson. Are oh the right, two stars. Yeah, Ted Danson is a part of my daily life, which is which is <laughs> cool. It's the coolest. But, is he a good uh, guy? He's yeah, he really is. Yeah, yeah. It was a it was a relief. You that's the type of person you just hope when you don't know, right? Yeah, you really don't. But he's like. He's a person, his, like, reputation precedes him. And right. And, like, you just, like, okay, well, we'll see. And then it's, it's all true. He's, it's, the, it's, he's the coolest. Oh, that's great. Yeah. It's so uh, it's so bizarrely disappointing to uh, to identify with, or know somebody your whole life on television. Yeah. And then they're just fucking monsters. <laughs> I know. It's a, it's, the, it's, it's a very, like, particular <laughs> sadness that's hard, you know, because, you know, you don't want to, like, tell people about it. You want uh. people to just, like continue yeah. believing that well that's the weird thing that you learn in show business is that you know some people are uh you know it's a degree you, you know it's it's a sad thing about how connected everybody is because there is an element of like you know respecting somebody's work and then realizing they're an asshole mm -hmm. but you know party is like no i gotta tell everybody <laughs> yeah. you know? no i yeah i definitely right? have no trouble telling yeah but no, now no, it's sort mean. of like oh fuck yeah. You, you got to fight uh, the the urge to tell every uh, the world. It's mostly like uh, it's like when you go home and you're hanging out with people from high school, right, right, or right. whatever. And they're like, "What's going on?" So you know, so and so. Yeah, then you're like, "Yeah, he's cool." Yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> right. You know, because it's like, what's the point of? I yeah. I have to be careful uh, with it because I've been I, I've been pretty diplomatic the last few years. Mm -hmm. 
But now that like I feel okay about myself, that's when I I start to to say the I start throwing people under right, the bus. Right, right, right. But not in a bad way, not my friends necessarily. But like you learn in show business, it's sort of like just you know be nice, and, yeah. You know, say like yeah, that guy's pretty good. I wish I had that in me. I have a couple friends who you know can go. Like they'll be at a party where yeah. everyone is talking right. shit, and then yeah. you like go home, and you're like, "Oh, that person didn't say a single thing. They laughed and nodded, but made nothing. Nothing. nothing yeah. did. And then you like, how do I trust uh, that guy? I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotta start talking shit about that. Yeah, guy. what's up with that yeah. dude? What's he gonna say? About, oh, what is it? Is this new special? Because I know you wanted me to do something for it, and I yeah. didn't, and I didn't, and I'm sorry. No, it's fine. No, I, I no, it was. It's what was the good. angle? What did you what what makes it different? Because I know there was a. It's not it's not just a straight stand up special. It is. It? I mean, there's it's an hour stand up. It's sort of bookended with this sketch stuff that I wrote. That oh yeah. Sort of the the premise of the sketch stuff is that I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to do perform like the perfect special. Yeah. So I'm getting the first part is like I'm getting advice from. You know, uh, oh, okay, okay. So, you have some from peers and from, heroes, yes, and whatnot. exactly. And then, um, and then it's the special, and I'm trying, I'm build, it's all building up to this award show called the American Humor Awards. And then, when the special ends, then we shot, we actually shot the fake award show. And, it's a fake award show, yeah, it's not a real thing. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's super, we made it look like the Oscars mixed with like the Mark Twain prize, <laughs> yeah, it's really stupid. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but I reached out to you. I reached out to a couple people. It was, you know, and it was like the first time I've ever kind of ever felt like a yeah. producer doing anything because I was just like desperately yeah, just yeah. trying to like. Who'd come. you get? Uh, for that, for that particular bit, it was, uh, George Wallace and Bo Burnham are the two people giving wow, me Wow, that's it. <laughs> yeah. That, those are, but that's outside the box. That's good. Yeah. And then yeah. George was, man, they're both, they're both so funny in it. Yeah. It was like, uh. George is something. Yeah, he really is. Was he wearing his beret? Of course he was. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't always wear it. I don't know no. when that started happening. It's, I remember him pre-beret. The main bit in the special. Yeah. Is that, um, I'm performing my special for the, like, ca- the Council of Judges. Oh, of the, the, for, for the oh, award show. Okay. So, like, there are a few cutaways to these, like, very, like, prestigious looking judges. Right. Yeah. So, like, they're, like, taking notes. But so, that's, that's, oh, that's it. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you made it, you created a narrative outside of the stand up. Right. But it's yeah. not, I hope, you know, I, I, from what, from my perspective, I didn't think it like was distracting. Well, all. you're a great stand-up and you're a great joke writer, and it's like one of those things where when I see you on Conan or something, mm-hmm. I'm like, this guy's so good. But you know, you definitely have you, you're a writer. Yeah. And and how how's that struggle going? I mean, the right idea. now it's just sort of bipolar. Like I spend like six months or so writing on yeah. whatever, and then we'll just spend the rest of the year like touring and. Now, did you get married? I did, yeah. How long ago was that? A couple years ago. Really? Yeah. I haven't talked to you in that long in any way. Yeah. How's the marriage? Good. Did yeah. Do you have a kid? No kid. I mean, we have two dogs we treat like children. Sure. Yeah. And and uh, what does she do? Is she in show business? Uh, she is not. She works for the ASPCA. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Do you, does she do like uh, hands-on stuff? Like- um, Sometimes. Uh, she mostly does like marketing and- uh, For ASPCA? Yeah. And like copywriting. Copy and and they, and what, what is, what do they, what do they do exactly? Um, I mean, they have a is lot it- of, it seems like they have, ta- they have uh, shelters in New York. Yeah. But they also have ta- these, they fund these task forces that uh-huh. break up like dog fighting rings and cock fighting rings. And, oh, really? Like, yeah, like, you know, those stories where you hear about like hoarders who have like 12, 12 cat. cats, 12, oh. or, like, like horses that are just, you know, I skeletons. Was, the hoarder, yeah, the ones where they find the cats in the garbage. Yeah, I mean, like, I, the, you know, just like the, the bones. <laughs> right. And yeah, the, the and like the lady, pancakes. Yeah, yeah, and the lady's like, I wondered what right. happened. Right. I mean, that's sort of like, it's mostly like when they, it's like usually bigger cases yeah. where like they have to bring in like s- they essentially have like a SWAT team on call to like for like people with 50 cats yeah it's nuts yeah oh my god I all I know I don't really she, she's also like uh she gets these phone calls that are like confidential and then she can't tell me but she'll be like a uh, secret animal yeah something that... about is about to happen I'm yeah it's, and it, does it break in the news yeah sometimes yeah oh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some, it's crazy. There's some shit going down. There was down. a crazy thing a couple, like a last year where she, she had to go to North Carolina for a week because there were so many animals at this place that they raided that they had to like essentially rent out a airport hangar 
And just like there was like hundreds of animals and of just, all different kinds, yeah. Until they could like figure out where to put them all. Just oh like, my god, all hands on deck, people flying in from all over the country to like ASPCA forces. Yeah, yeah. She was like cleaning out cat cages. <laughs> Got a suburban zoo <laughs> issue. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah, it's crazy. There's, there's a place in North Carolina where they have tigers. The tiger rescue. Oh really? Yeah, it's pretty wild. It's crazy. I went to a uh, we went to a uh, ostrich farm in oh, yeah? Solvang recently. In Solvang? Yeah. Wow, just a visit? We were there for a wedding, but then, you know, we had a day to kill in Solvang. It's so like seeing dinosaurs. It really is. It's like <laughs> the lamest Jurassic Park. But they they are freaky, and they just eat food out of your hands. They're, they're giant birds. They're giant birds, and they run in a very funny fashion. It's, they're real dinosaurs. They are, yeah. It's wild. What are they? They are they farm them up there? I, I mean- meat? Don't really know. I mean, it like what else are you going to use it for? What would you have an ostrich farm for? People eat ostrich meat. Yeah, there were they really... were selling ostrich jerky, but they also had like ostrich eggs signed by Khloe Kardashian that was like in a glass case. So maybe oh, that's important. That is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how's now? What's going on with the uh, with the Twitter feed? What were you doing? You were retweeting. Uh, you made know. a career out of retweeting things. Yeah. What was that? What was the angle on that again? Just I, corporate retweets. I did that for a while. What now, was it? What was it though? Them doing? I I used to have fun on um like nine eleven, like nine eleven corporate tweets. Oh, was, yeah. A, yeah. was fun. Yeah. Um, uh, gun gun manufacturers uh-huh. often tweet funny stuff on holidays. Uh huh. Uh, now I'm just like I'm so deep into like Trump. Yeah. Like idiot yeah. universe that yeah. I I like. I feel filthy. Like I have, I, I've pulled out totally. Oh, uh, I'm fully in. I can't. I can't. Do you fight with Nazis? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like it's very strange to just become completely desensitized to like seeing your face being shoved into a oven, an oven by a cartoon frog or whatever. So like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you are desensitized. Totally. One thousand. I did. It does nothing. <laughs> yeah. Did, was there a point where it did? I mean, it's, 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 when you, it's, uh, Dave Chappelle's uh, monologue when he hosted SNL yeah. is just like, we have a internet troll as president. Like, that's what it is. And so, like, it's just trolling. Like, I don't, like, it right. doesn't really affect me. If it, if it were, I don't know, if they, if they were something else, maybe it would affect me, but I'm sort of desensitized to Do that. you find that, well, let me ask you this, because what happened with me and Twitter was that, you know, once he took office, I was like, I'm done. I'm mm-hmm. done feeding this. I don't want to fight. It, de- it is taxing to me. Yeah. I'm not desensitized. Yeah. It's not so much I take it personally, but it's sort of like it takes up energy. It causes me aggravation because even if I'm being desensitized towards, you know, horror is one thing, but engaging in emotional fighting, like I'm, the idea that you're going to win. No, yeah. I mean, like, when you say, like, am I fighting with Nazis? Not really. Like, I'm, I don't really respond to people that oh, often. Yeah, right. Like, I, it's mostly like, uh, I'm, I. You'll well, tweet something out and you'll I'll just see it. Come make back. fun of something like Donald Trump Jr. says right. or whatever. Yeah, right. Seb Gorka or right. any of those people. Yeah. yeah. I haven't heard his name in a while. Um, but, yeah, I just, I was like, I'm not feeding this anymore. I feel you. I mean, like, I. I, I feel better, dude. I have more time. That's great. Like, it, it's not, you know, I don't, I'm not great sitting with myself, mm-hmm. but I, it's a nice to know that, that, uh, that, that's still operating. I know. I mean, it's super <laughs> unhealthy. It really is. And I'm like, I just vacillate between like just the darkest part of like Trump t- yeah. Twitter. And then like to get relief, I will then just read like NBA trade rumors. And that's like what makes me happy. It's like one of the few things in the world. <laughs> so it's just like, it's either basketball that makes me happy or just like, I'm just like going back and forth. But in the big picture, do you feel as an intelligent person who fights a good fight, do you feel that, that Twitter is doing anything good? No, I mean, well, the thing is, and the, 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 not that it's like a noble fight because it's not it's stupid, but there is something to the fact that like this is the medium that the president has chosen to right. be his like his lifeline to his right. people. Right. So, so you got to you got to operate. You got to be dragged down to his level. That's, sort of, that's a unique thing. It's like we're all being dragged down we, to the president's level. It's crazy. Level. Yeah. Um, 
but I, you know, there are, there are, I actually just recently, <laughs> I paid some website like $12 to just delete all my old tweets from like anything older than like two years really? ago or something. Yeah. And they do that? Yeah. I don't know how, but it's just like, I was just like, I don't need a like permanent, I don't History. need like some, like whatever I was yelling at 10 right. years or right. 2010 to like haunt me later. Right. So yeah, just. Well, I think that it's interesting because sometimes I will look at Twitter. I don't like, and occasionally I'll answer questions, but I primarily use it for promo now. Yeah. And, and like, I'll answer questions sometimes if I'm, um, but I used to be locked into it. Like, you know, you'd spend hours there, you know, and now I do think that it does good because sometimes I get, I learn things first there. Like, cause you're not, I'm not tapped into every news site. Right. And sometimes, sometimes someone will tweet something like, oh, fuck. Right. That happened. Yeah. And also I think that, you know, organizing, I think sometimes it's proactive and it helps. And it seems to me that the hashtag President Bannon actually got up Trump's ass. Seemed like it. it more, more the magazine cover. Oh, that was, that was it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's how you get in. That's how you, you, something that gets ratings. Yeah. It's like, it's literally like whoever's on the cover of Time magazine. That'll do it. Yeah. It's crazy. (laughs) He's a fucking child. Yeah. Yeah. There's some big problems, dude. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I really don't know. You know, it's never a dull moment. I've never, like, I've never felt this, like, embarrassed before. I you know, know like, I even know. when, like, I know, and Bush was president, I didn't feel like I could, like, I would, I could travel abroad and, you know, not feel, like, embarrassed. You, yeah, with Bush, you were sort of like, I, it, I, yeah, I didn't, I I didn't yeah, do that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, right. But this guy, it's sort of like, oh, my God. Yeah. My favorite thing is to talk to people about like, yeah, you hate Trump. Everyone hates Trump mm. in my world. Yeah. Um, but it's like, I love finding out who's, who's like the second person, you know? Cause some days for me is Jared Kushner. Like I obsess over Jared Kushner. He makes me crazy. Uh-huh. And then sometimes it's, you know, Jeff Sessions or whoever, but it's like, Bannon, it's Bannon's, Bannon's yours. Yeah. yeah. You're a Bannon guy. I'm a Bannon guy. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and you're like, you know, I was a Bannon, Stephen Miller guy, but mm-hmm. I don't know. He seems, Stephen Miller seems to have, you know, found his way, you know, up Jared's ass sure. somehow. Sure. This weird alignment between, you know, white supremacists and, 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 uh, grandchildren of Holocaust yeah, survivors. Yeah, Orthodox Jews. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's it, I unbelievable. Don't, I don't know what's happening at that level. But, uh, all right. So when's the special on? Uh, July 25th. Okay. Yeah. And your dogs are good. Dogs are great. Wife is good. Yeah. You're happy with the special? I think so. Well, do you, do you, do you get that weird thing where you like, you know, like, but I'm a stand up, not a writer? <laughs> yes. I mean, that's, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that I'm working through those issues in the, in the special itself. Just good. like the, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's like, totally. I, yeah. I mean, the money's good with writing. You're, you're, you're in a good environment. Mm-hmm. You like the show you're on. You yeah. go pitch jokes, but in your heart, you're a stand up. Yes. And then there are times where like, I'll be on the road for three weeks. Yeah. And I'm alone ordering like Domino's pizza and some awful places. It's just like, I should like go, I should be at my job. <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> Is this so, the quality of yeah, life right. I'm looking forward to? Right. I don't know. So, I mean, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out like the right balance. I definitely feel like, um, I'm sort of half of both or whatever. Well, yeah, but the, you know, you know, in your heart and your mind that like, no matter how bad it's going to get over there at the office, I got WGA health insurance. Uh, uh-huh. You know, yeah. I got a pretty steady paycheck as long as the show's on the right, air. Yeah. Right. That shit makes a difference. Yeah, it does. <laughs> totally. Yeah. All right. Well, it's good talking to you, Joe. Good talking to you. All right. As I mentioned, Joe Mandy. That was Joe Mandy. His new stand-up special called Joe Mandy's Award-Winning Stand-Up Special is now streaming on Netflix. Go enjoy that. Hey, 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 you know what can be a real racket? Home security, folks. Thousands of people who just want to protect their homes will get ripped off every day. You get locked into long-term contracts and it can cost you a lot of money. Now there's a smarter way to protect your home. Simply Safe Home Security. These are the guys we trust here on WTF. My producer recently got on board with Simply Safe and he loves it because it was easy to set up. It's reliable, affordable, and he saved money on his homeowner insurance by having it. Best of all, Simply 
Simply Safe has no contracts. There's no commitment, no lock-ins, nothing like that. Professional monitoring with police dispatch 24-7, and it's just 15 bucks a month. And, and did I mention no contracts? Yeah, I did, but I'll say it again, no contracts. It's wireless, it's portable, it's unbeatable protection at a great value. And right now, Simply Safe is having its biggest ever summer sale, a hundred bucks off the special safeguard package. Visit simplysafe.com slash WTF to get this deal, which you should do now because this sale ends soon. That's simplysafe.com slash WTF. Dig it. David Allen Greer. Wow, dag. He's been around for a long time and he's always been fucking funny. Always been funny. From Living Color to the movies to being on Broadway to being on the radio to the Carmichael show to, I mean, he just, yeah, he's been around a long time too, man. And we don't really know each other. We might have met, I think we met once, but. I was excited to talk to him. He has a new show on GSN called Snap Decisions. It premieres Monday, August 7th. The series finale of The Carmichael Show airs August 9th on NBC. I do want to make clear that when I talked to him, I did not know that the show had been canceled. And he he told me after. (laughs) I don't know. But uh, I was sad to hear that. I liked it. But we talked about everything. I You know, there's a lot of stuff. You know, he he had quite a life and he was, uh, you know, he wanted to be an actor, and he's a great actor, but he's also one of the funniest guys around. This is me and David Allen Greer talking here in the garage. You know, if Trump wanted to play by the same rules as Obama... Well, what are the rules? We get final cut. They don't get to ah, vet right, okay. questions. Right, yeah. They, You know, like, I mean, he's pretty good like that. I, I'm not mm-hmm. sure what I would do with him or what point it would serve because... Um, I just think you'd have to just turn the thing on and just... I know, but they, what are you going to get? You know, what... You know what Trump. It? Just him. I know, but he gives that all the time and it's all yes, bullshit. True. And, that's you know, true. it's like, you know, what if, if I, I can get to the core of it, I mean, I grew up with a narcissistic dad. I know what's in there. <laughs> I know it's at the core of that personality. Yeah, my a dad, whole lot of my fuck dad you. Was a, uh, psychiatrist. Oh, really? Yeah. So, <laughs> so what? What do you make of it? What do you make of your dad being a psychiatrist? Well, he just passed. Well, he didn't just pass. He passed away about yeah. a year ago. And um, what do I make of it? Most of my, he never got psychiatric on me. You know, because that's that like, that you know the, of. Well, uh, yeah, okay, but uh, uh, except for one time, uh-huh. but it's not because I think the perception is uh, the routine comeback is your father's psychiatrist. Yeah. Well, did he analyze you? No, that day to day was not. Uh, I think you're. Let's use our words. Oh right, you know, right. No, he was just like sit down, shut up, you know, like a normal parent. Except for one time when I was like, you know, feeling myself. I said, Dad, what's the <clears throat> what's the definition of insanity? And he just looked at me and smirked. He goes, yeah. it means nothing. It is a legal definition. Like, you right. idiot. Shut right. up. Yeah, what are you talking Get about? Get out of the car. I'll <laughs> pick you up at five. And I was like, oh, but words I, are weapons. I, I think that the, the generally, it seems to me that the, the common thing about being the kid of a psychiatrist is uh, is that they're always a little weird. Well, yeah. I married the child of a psychiatrist. Well, then, then and uh, but she was, she didn't strike me as weird. But then I knew some other kids, and they seemed weird. But I don't know why mm-hmm. that would be. Maybe that's something we project onto people. Your dad's a shrink. You. It was weird. always projected on me. You know, it was. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, he passed away. My, yeah. my father died, and I we just got these papers, all this stuff of this writing that he did. Uh, a long time ago about his life. It was kind of like, I don't know what it was Unpublished? No, yeah, yeah, absolutely. They were just private, you know, musings. Like he had had a series of questions. Clearly, this is an elongated biography. My father also was an author. So I don't know at what time yeah. uh, or right. whatever. But he would always use any kind of method to yeah. write. Yeah. But the point being is, as an African-American uh, going to med school and desiring to become a psychiatrist at that time, I think there were one or two other black uh, right. uh, students in med school at Michigan. And so that's what was incredible. And, you know, studying at the Meninger Clinic and this it and that. It was at the Meninger Clinic. That's I a big believe, one. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. And it was... So it's uh, a completely unique experience he's writing about. It yes. could be one of two or three African-Americans. Yes, absolutely. 
So that must have been why. So it talks about his challenges, maybe. He, uh, he, he, he talks about. Right. But, but more it was, um, you know, by rote, but there was some insight, meaning as a young student, yeah. you know, or as, yeah. a, as a resident, uh, faced with, um, probably 99.9% Caucasian men. Right. Uh, uh, just how do you get ahead? And I, you know, I mean, I know my father told me, he said, well, I really didn't have a choice. If you wanted to be your own boss and you were a person of color, you had to be a doctor, lawyer, dentist, or else you're working for a, a, a someone who's white who will subjugate you. Or a shop owner of some kind. To yes, owner. exactly. Right, so right. you had to go into business for yourself. And so that was the whole aim. So, so it wasn't necessarily the, a passion <clears throat> to, uh, to, you think that it was, well, it must have been. No, he my father was. psychiatry. That's not like, when you're thinking about, I want to go into business. I didn't know? go into it. I wasn't <laughs> smart know? enough. That's I mean. a, that seems like a lot to put in. You know, you got to put in the medical school, oh, yeah. the internship, the in, residency. In 1940 something. That's you know? crazy. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, what were you thinking? And so my dad is and was the smartest person. I ever knew. I mean, I think he went to college and he was like 16 and, you know, he's brilliant. He oh, yeah. Really, so, really smart. So how much of this writing is there? Uh, well, um, I found two copies. My brother and I, uh, I think my father's. Just widow. two of you? Yeah. No, my sister. Uh -huh. I'm the youngest. Yeah. Uh, but but we found these papers. They were given to us, you know, from his widow who's cleaning out stuff. You guys right. might want to. Yeah. But two or two different copies of the same thing. Most of it is family history. You know, my uh. Uh, like my my grandmother was born in 1900, and I remember uh, you know a ritual when I was with my grandmother. Uh, yeah. When I was very little, we'd sleep. You know, do sleep over, and I see grandmother tell me about when you were a little girl, uh -huh. and she would always start with these sweet stories, <laughs> and it was like, and then that boy was Lance and they cut his tongue out and <laughs> no. hung him by his penis. Anyway, who wants a cookie? You know, I'm like, uh, ooh. But, you know, as a kid, I, I just was fascinated. I, it was like hearing about the Wild West. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, so so uh, as I got older, then I realized this is not just an adventure. This is reality. Exactly. Yeah, and it's yeah. racist and f hate filled. You know, as a child, it's just the adventure. Like uh, yeah. uh, when the stagecoach was, you know, raided by the Indians. That's what it sounded well, like. Well, you can't you, know? you can't connect it to reality until you put no. things into context. It's just a horrible story. Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. it sounds like your dad intended to publish this thing if there were two copies of it. It ain't getting published now. <laughs> Don't even, I know you're already. So this is a painting that you found on the back of a masterpiece. No, but it does. You know, I have a daughter. Why can't you publish it? You can well, publish it. it, it does he it have were... a following? What was he wrote a, a book? Well, he was a 89. Big book. Yeah, he had a big following in 68. Yeah, you know? 1968. Oh, yeah. But my father was the radical. To, you know, he, he, you know, he and my mom, they got a divorce. He left. Yeah. He moved out to San Francisco. Right. The summer before the summer of love. So, right. So he was on the couch. So this. that was just the, the summer of, of racial bullshit. Yes. Well, like, well, before the summer of love, it was just like 10 years of horrible racial tension. Well, we had driven out. I remember one yeah. uh, summer vacation. My brother just reminded me of this. Like, we were kids in Detroit. We went to Disneyland. I was like nine years old. We drove across country and every stop, you know, once yeah. we got to Amarillo, Texas, that was the first stop. You know, my father yeah. would come back to the car. Uh, guys, they don't like Negroes, <laughs> so let's keep our voice. Boys, stay in the car, please. <laughs> yeah. Jeffrey, put your put your skateboard down. Let's just listen with our ears. <laughs> so there was a lot of that. But as kids, yeah. I remember my brother and I, we'd go to these motels. There'd be yeah. these white kids in the pool. We'd jump in the pool. They ran out. No. And I'm like, let's go chase them. My brother was like, man, get your motherfucking <laughs> ass in the car. They hate you, you big head. You know, and you'd punch me. But to me, it was like, no, man, let's go make them play with us. You still didn't get it. No. To this day, I do yeah. not. <laughs> I, I'm right. telling you the yeah, truth. Right. Danny, um, Danny yeah. McBride, I'm at the airport early yeah. in the morning. We, I see him, you know, and I yeah. just go over there and introduce myself. We're on the same flight. Yeah. Whatever. Two days later, I get an offer to do this film. And I type to my email, my, uh, my, my, my agent. I'm like, that is so crazy. Cause you know, Danny and I were on the same flight and I introduce myself and I get this offer. The universe is bananas. And there was a silence. And then it's like, yeah, he said that he met you. 
Then he gave you the offer. I said, but yeah, but what's the connection, though? There is none. It's just Providence. You know, I still didn't get it. I still didn't. You're just yes, idiot. So you, that's why you got the offer. You, so you, that's, that's great. You live in a magical world. If you're lucky. Dense. Yeah, you, 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 everything is magic to you. But then there was like, maybe I shouldn't verbalize. I should just internalize so they don't realize what kind so, of idiot But I'm kind of interested in the, yeah. the idea. So your dad moves to San Francisco? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to bounce around a lot. In so, 1968? Well, no. Here's what it went down. You know, my parents, I remember there was a family meeting and yeah. my, my mom and dad's like, you know, your father and I are having problems and we want you to know. This was very psychiatric. When I think back, we want you kids to Progressive. know. Progressive. It's yeah. not your fault. Right. It is our uh, issue that yeah. we're going to work through. Right. And uh, we're not getting a divorce. And it was like, that's the word. Like, what is a divorce? These are the words I learned as a child. What is assassination? How is assassination different than murder? Then I was told, you know, when Kennedy and all that. So divorce, what is divorce? You right. know, and they told us and then they, anyway, we told all our friends we're supposed to move to California. We packed up. Yeah. My father goes ahead and that was it. You know, he writes to my mom a letter, uh, by the way, you're not joining us. So that's how it went down. Yeah. Very classic 60s yeah. divorce. Yeah. And uh, so he got a waterbed, uh, a dashiki, mm -hmm. you know, he, uh -huh. was, he was, come on. Uh -huh. He was like uh, midlife uh -huh. crisis. It's the 60s. Some African art and posters? Not African no, art. No. But he did like, you know, the, the peripheral <laughs> Black Panther stuff, you know. Sure. Did he have one of these uh, Afro rakes? Oh, With yes. The, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. My, my father taking us to the barbershop. Yeah. Cut these boys' hair in an afro. <laughs> you are not colored. You black. You know, I was like, oh, oh okay. And he made the but, jump. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. So when Obama was, like, elected, my father was like, Man, fuck him. He's not black enough. <laughs> he should be telling all these white folks, kiss my ass. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That would have like, helped out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, daddy could do that, but he's probably not going to be president. <laughs> you know, he didn't want to hear it. He but so did, did you, so you went back and forth from Detroit to, to San Francisco when, as a kid or like? Well, uh, we went to visit my dad. We, I, we would see him so like you live once your mom. a year. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it was absolutely. But I remember going to visit him. And so you got to imagine this. It was, 68 in crazy. San Francisco. A circus. Oh, my it's God. We Yeah, we get off the plane, and my father goes, I'm going to take you to People's Park. And we're mm -hmm. like, you know, you got to hear this. This is our political education. We're like, yeah. what kind of park is this? Yeah. You know, there's a fence around it, and there are no, <laughs> there are no toys. <laughs> where, yeah. are the, where are the swings? Yeah, you know, my father's <laughs> like, the toys are in your mind. <laughs> yeah, man. Your yeah, yeah. Still. Then he takes us to the Black Panther headquarters, and we see the hippies, and we're just like. you went. To, uh, he took you to Oakland? Yes, uh -huh. that was a tourist yeah. spot, and for, for your dad, we, here's yes, the, here's the Panthers. Yeah, we got there the day that Bobby Hutton, who was a 16 year old Black Panther, uh -huh. was murdered by the police. Okay, it was his funeral. So, and we were like, "Now you're taking us to a funeral? What the fuck is this? You know, where is Disneyland?" Yeah. So that was uh, that was my life, you know. And and then going back to Detroit, you know, my dad had this huge book. What book uh, was it? It was called Black Rage. D did he? That, was that his turn? Did he? Yes, coin that I, term? you have to Google it before I say yes. I don't want to, you know, put my foot in it. But it became sure. whatever it was. It became popularized by this book. This book was a, a huge bestseller. What was it about? It was the Black Rage Defense, meaning you, Mark, and your forefathers yeah. have subjugated and oppressed me so much yeah. that if I stab the fuck out of you right now, that's because of my inherent built-in black rage. Well, you had family in Eastern Europe. <laughs> <laughs> don't man i see what you're trying to do <laughs> no but i mean that's part of it my but, you know, people were helping you <laughs> exactly <laughs> no i have a jewish friend she goes so what my great grandmother was raped by the cossack right. we all have a cross we, we tried to make up for it we were down <laughs> exactly. there we got you the voting thing we were down no, there no but i mean so I, i'm you have to read it yeah because one of the things my did father you read did, it of course yeah one of the things my father did for the rest of his life is like you know he he hated when that book was used as a legal defense. Yeah. He hated like professional psychiatrists, you know, uh, DeAndre uh, yeah. severed Mark's head because uh, he felt <laughs> oppressed by his white presence. Uh. You know, he didn't like all that stuff, you know. So so he was he saw it more as an academic thing as, as opposed to a practical defense I, I, for any crime a black person might commit. 
That's one aspect. But yeah. he also didn't like people moving when he talked, so but <laughs> you put them all together. <laughs> literally. Was, literally. Was, he, was he a clinical psychiatrist? Like I just, yes. Had, so he had an office, people would come yes, over? Yes, yes, yes. But, but he had an office, and it was very 60s, because I remember going down to visit him. So it had In like, Detroit? Yes. Yeah. There was a downtown yeah. plaza that was very hip. It's called Lafayette Park. Yeah. And when he moved there, he had another office in downtown Detroit, like the book building, which uh-huh. was just, you know, right yeah. downtown. But he moved to this new office. It had the double door, the couch. It looked like a fucking James Bond movie. And, you know, the white chick was his secretary. Oh, hello, David. Uh, I was like, <laughs> yeah, man, this is it. <laughs> this is Woo! how you live. Hell yeah. So Drove a Buick 225. Is that that Detroit that you grew up in? Is it mm-hmm. gone? I mean, like, what yeah. what part of, like, I know, I, you know, I hear things I don't want to judge. I know that there's some mm-hmm. areas of Det- Detroit that are coming back. I've performed outside of Detroit, but, mm-hmm. but, but the 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 news out now is that mm. you know Detroit's sort of decimated. All right, listen, I'm talking pre-riot, sure, early '60s Detroit. You know, in our minds, industrial we, like powerhouse. Like, yeah, man, yeah. it was like the cars the was before yeah, yeah. the Japanese or uh-huh. Europeans. Would they? We were king of the world, glorious I mean, city. Fuck yeah. It was like the fifth largest city in the world. Yeah. I mean, in, in America, rather. Yeah. And we thought, well, I live in a cosmopolitan area. You went to private schools and yeah. very hip and cool. And this is the life, you know. So you went, you went to a private school? For a while. For yeah. a while. Like when we were very young. I just got these pictures from like kindergarten, first to second grade. And it's me and a sea <laughs> of racists. <laughs> no, and a sea of like white kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and there's like the one Wearing other... a little jacket? Were you wearing a little jacket? Oh, suit and tie. Oh, really? And I had this bolo like... Uh-huh. It was really little kid stuff. So that's a, that's it. Like, see, that's an interesting kind of upbringing in terms of like, you know, because I... You, people make assumptions that there was a very healthy black middle class in Detroit when you were growing up. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. it. Well, well, think about this. You know, the car companies, when they were thriving, yeah. that was a very comfortable middle class existence that people could count on right. from high school t- until retirement. Yeah. So that was guaranteed. These were post-war union jobs. Yeah. Uh, African Americans. I mean, that's why all of these black people were in Chicago, Detroit. I mean, that's what attracted them initially. Yeah. Is these jobs. I think my grandmother's brothers. So my grand uncles, you know, one comes, then the whole family comes. They have uh, where jobs are they from? Here. They're Originally? from Mississippi by way oh, yeah. of Alabama. Uh-huh. So forget about it. If you're saying in the 30s. Yeah. Uh, Let's get the fuck out. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> this is an actual life where yeah. we won't be oppressed and beaten and killed and lynched. So that's the scenario. Uh, and very progressive. I yeah. mean, we went to, as a kid, you know, my father's friends, we all went to this, quote, progressive, really progressive school at mm-hmm. that time. So that was the first kind of school I remember, the school bus and all that stuff. Oh, yeah? Like yeah. What progressive, not like a Montessori school, but just an integrated, tolerant, yes. um, uh, uh, yes. kind of like, this is the uh, this is the way democracy works. Kind oh, absolutely. Of I remember yeah. being brought into the auditorium and watching the assassination coverage of uh, John F. Kennedy. You know, I think I was in first or second grade, a 19-inch black and white yeah. television. You do, and- you do remember that. Oh, absolutely. Oh. I remember our class, we wrote sympathy letters to Jackie Kennedy. Yeah, yeah. Of course, they were graded. <laughs> Come on. I'm not kidding you. It, for <laughs> so years. So they sent them out with a B minus on them? When David said, I'm sorry, that's a <laughs> compound word. I'm, there was no <laughs> Yeah. And it was marked up, but yeah. I lost the letter. I wish I could find it because it was. So that's like, because you're a little older than me. Like, oh. I'm 53. Oh, I'm 47. Oh, I'm sorry. I, mis- yeah. I must have misread. I 47. Died. You look great. Well, thank you. I just dyed my mustache. <laughs> yes, I'm 61. I'm 61. 61. Mm hmm. So you you do have memory like I was born the year that he got shot two months before yeah. he was shot I don't have any memory yeah. I have memories of Watergate but I and Vietnam War looking at the Watergate TV Watergate was boring to me after like uh, everyone just guys shot. sitting at microphones yeah. you know what I mean uh, like uh, yeah, for hours right right but uh, but the Vietnam War I, hell I remember that on TV like it was terrifying I just remember guys in the jungle mm-hmm. you know like it just bad well, first news first of all I, I there was a kid one of my best friends around the block yeah his cousin teenage cousin went to Vietnam. So I'd never heard a word like Vietnam. It was like Klingon to yeah. me. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was like, what is a Vietnam? Where is it? And he said, you know, it's in 
Asia. Yeah. And he, his cousin fought in spider holes. And, and immediately I'm like, they have spider, spider holes big, big enough big, yeah. for people to crawl into? <laughs> In a place called Vietnam, I don't want to be there. Is that what they're fighting? <laughs> yeah. So that was my <clears throat> introduction to it. But I remember watching. You've you progressed that one, haven't you? I mean, Not much. <laughs> fake news. I'm all for it. Come on. Isn't that what we do every night? Yeah, you live in magic land. Yes. Yes, yeah, of course. There's no connection. Yeah. Mark, come on. Yeah. But I remember watching the draft yeah. lottery. Right. And my brother's number was 18, I think. Like he should have been on the first bus. And he got out of it. He's know, that much older than you? He's four years older than uh -huh. me. So, uh, and it was like the end of the war, like 70, 71. Yeah, yeah, right. Th that was bad then because then they, they're just shoveling oh, people yeah. to die. Yes. There was, you know, like if you got there that year, you're yeah. sort of like, this is just about me. Yes. If you want me to go someplace I don't want to go, I'm going to shoot you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, so, you know, I'm talking about this because for years I thought my dad was so brilliant. He yeah. got my brother off. And it wasn't until I was grown, my dad goes, he had nothing to do with it. You know, yeah. my brother, like, you know, didn't bathe for like two weeks, you know, and just took a bunch of speed and walked in there talking crazy. And they're like, you, sir, yeah. may remain home. <laughs> We're not going. <laughs> exactly. We don't need you. We, we, yeah. and, and we don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> exactly. It seems like you understand it. <laughs> There's no connection, yeah. sir. So where did you go to, uh, like, how did it progress for you? So what, it, when you were a kid, you grew mm -hmm. up in, an, in, in a nice life, you yeah. know, uh, well-educated, good folks. Beautiful house, same what house. What did your mom do? She was just, well, I don't want to say just, she was, as a young child, yeah. until my father left, yeah. you know, uh, she was a housewife. Right. And then once the, the divorce, you know, he left and then she went back to teaching, which she always hated, which I, I it, there's a perverse comedy in there now, but she was just the, she hated it, but she had to do it. <laughs> she hated she was like a, Yeah. She was like a t kindergarten teacher and, you know, so. And she went back to that hating, yeah. hating kids, hating I teaching knew, them. Well, I feel bad, but I mean, we were like, you know, when you're kids, you're like, yeah. dude, come on, man. I need Hot Wheels. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to hear about, you know, fulfillment. <laughs> uh, no, you're just like, I am, what's more important than me? Well, what was your, like, what were you aspiring to as, as a kid? Like when you uh, did, well, you're in a magic bubble. We've established that. <laughs> like, uh, were you, How dare you, which, sir? What compelled you towards, uh, uh, towards I, the arts? I love, you know what I used to do when I was a little kid? And yeah. I Back of boys' life, or you know, oh my god, I haven't heard about that magazine yeah, in a while. Or, or like they had the boys' you, life. Yeah, can you draw this fawn? Sure. And right, I would do that. Right, there was yeah. Oh, you and I would. Right. I would they'd be like, D sir, you have uh, you're brilliant. Those, right those animals with the human eyes ish, yeah. like the, <laughs> sort of like compassionate eyes. There was a yeah. squirrel or something. Right, yeah. a fawn. So you drew it. Exactly. Sent it in. Sent it in, and uh, that was before I found out that it was kind of a ripoff. But I mean, I just remember, like, I wanted to be a painter, yeah, an artist, or biology, you know, painter or biology, yeah, sure, animals. I yeah. memorized every amphibian. And oh yeah, toad and frog. How, do you still remember them? Yeah, I know what's not in Michigan because yeah. they used to put out these regional. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that we don't have bullfrogs; we have green frogs. Oh, good, good. Which was a. Uh, uh, a, a so little sadness. Sure, but in in the event that someone goes, look at that bullfrog. You're like, green nope. Uh-uh. Yeah, and then you have an argument. Maybe get hit. I would argue you down. Sure, sure. Because for um, what was it? Show and tell. Uh huh. I would get up there with this book and just lecture the class on uh -huh. why we don't have Pacific spotted <laughs> sure lake turtles yeah. in Michigan because. See, you like you like the research of it, <laughs> right? Like I saw some uh, map of rats yesterday. <laughs> oh. You know, you get the you get the the Norway rat, <laughs> yes. and then you get and then you get tree rats, and they're like you First know, of we, all tree rats, dude. No, I think they are called tree rats. Ah, there are. That's what freaked me out. They're here. The yes, trees. that's that metal band around the palm trees. I was like, is that for the homeless children so they don't climb <laughs> climb up for a coconut? Yeah, what the exactly. Fuck you no, they date? had. They want a date. <laughs> They have nests of rats in trees? Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Now, apparently, that's the ones we got here. No, thank you. Yeah. So, you didn't go into biology. You didn't go into painting. Uh, it was uh, too hard. Painting. Yeah, biology is required. Your dad probably, well, he probably had something to say about biology. He had to do all that shit. Well, I remember he goes, so, you know, he left. He was out there. And so, I was oh, like, you know, <laughs> it was college time. College yeah, time. And so, was like, he talking like, hey, man? No, he was uh, like, uh, I assume that... Um, <laughs> <laughs> the profundance of uh, 
<laughs> thoughts and feelings. I mean, that's how he talked to me. And I'd be like, what? He's like, you know very well what my musings mean. I'm like, musings? What the fuck? <laughs> so he, he, yeah, he sent me like this yeah. application yeah. for U, University of California, Berkeley's chemistry department. And I'm like, are you insane? Yeah. Do you know I've been doing acid for the last four years? I can't do this. You know, so I just went on to Michigan. You were an acid guy? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah? Mescaline, THC. More than I care to. In high school? Yeah, started about 15, 14. Window pain. Really? That so that was the good shit. So it, that was, I've never been that high ever in my life. What was that like? The, so what year was that? 70? I'm going to say 71, Yo, something so, like that. So it had trickled into the mainstream, like acid was uh, around. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we got it. You know, yeah. Same thing as like, give Billy you know, your $5. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that was you went out there, huh? Uh, I did, man, and it was. I'll put it like this: it was like it took me twelve hours to realize I was in a room with no ceiling that was on fire. Yeah, so that's how high I was. What, was was it really on fire? No, it was my mom's living room. <laughs> I mean, what do you know? And my mom followed me around. It, this is you're not supposed you, to trip with your mom. <laughs> exactly. Well, that was never the plan. My friends <laughs> dropped me off on the front lawn, and my mom found me at like three in the morning playing with the dog, like. See, it's no connection. Oh my god! <laughs> you know, so she was worried. She was yeah, a single sure, mom, sure, and, sure. and her um, son's on acid playing yeah, with the dog. Yeah, talking about Jimi Hendrix or yeah. whatever. You know. Oh, but you got to like. It's so nice to like. I envy that you were cognizant and engaged in in the world when that shit was happening. Like by yeah. six, in sixty eight seventy two, I was was nine. So I'd see pictures. I saw Mad Magazine, but like yeah. you were like a few years older. So you're like, I, get, I got the record, man. Well, my brother actually saw Hendrix. I never saw him, but there's a very... Oh, that's right. You got the older brother with the shit. There's a story that is needs to be told. I've never actually... I wrote it down because yeah. I actually did research and stuff to go back and ask, but... This time that my brother told me that, you know, Hendrix had come to Detroit and I m must have just turned 13. Yeah. And he went, he wouldn't take me. Yeah. And he met Hendrix. You come know, on. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Hendrix, they went to his dressing room and he brought him on stage. This was a myth in my family. And for years, I just thought my brother told me this to rub it in, you know, and he, I never like he made it up. Him. Yeah, I always thought I never really yeah. believed him. And, uh, just a couple of years ago, he told me how he got this email from his friend, Michael, who yeah. had gone with him that night. And he read me the email and I'm in the car and my eyes well up because it was like, I remember all the cool stuff we did. It's so great to connect with you. Remember that night with Hendrix and how he talked to us? And it was all you, man. Like, it, yeah. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my God. <laughs> My brother was a hobbit! Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, really, like, he, he met the Dwarf King. Yeah. And so I just was like, oh my God, I never believed, believed it. I still get goosebumps. <laughs> and so it was just a bonding thing, like, oh my gosh, she wasn't lying. Oh my, is, where's your brother at? He's living in Daly City. Yeah. Living in Daly City. He moved to with, with my dad. Oh, by your dad, yeah. And he never came back. I mean, he just stayed in the Bay Area. And uh, what's he do? Was, uh, he is retired. Uh -huh. He he took care of my mom until the very end. She oh. moved ninety five and a half. Wow. And he did the dirty work. Oh, he did. Oh my God, F daily. Yeah, man. yeah. You know, I was, acting, I was like, God you know, I can take her, man. Yeah. But I'm busy. I, you know, I'm doing a lot of things, <laughs> man. Dinglings. I got Thursday to Sunday, so you know, <laughs> so, so I send the money and stuff. Right. Yeah. He is going to heaven. I mean, that, <laughs> yeah. trust me. Yeah. So he's chilling. I mean, that's he's nice. Chilling. And your yeah, sister yeah, yeah. is still around? She's living still in Detroit. And oh, yeah. I'm the, you know, youngest. So here well, we go. And you're all close. I'm closer to my brother. Yeah. But it, if you have brothers and sisters, it goes weird. There was a point when it goes was, in and out. Exactly. I was closer to my sister when she moved near me when I was in New York, like in 75. What do you, I think that has something to do with the fact that like me and my brother are close, but like mm -hmm. when it gets too close and, yeah. and, and they, they, you know, you know them inside and out, they know you inside and out. Yeah. And if they're fucking up and they don't want to cop to it, then yeah. it gets a little trippy, right? You're yes. like, you know, yes. what's going on with you? I'm all right. Yeah. It's like, dude, get the, mm -mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like one time my brother goes, he goes, you know, like, yeah, my nephew's he's 21 or whatever. He's like, I mean, you know, he's 
acting crazy. And I'm like, what is, what, like what? Give me an example, man. You know, talk to me. No, I mean, he's like, like I'm crazy. You know, he's saying like I'm crazy, but it's not me. I know it's him. I'm like, well, get what, what is the service? Say? Well, I was saying, you know, he's 19, 20, whatever. We can sit, watch porn together. I was like, time out, time out, time out. <laughs> Um, see, that's inappropriate. Hey. Why? We're both young adults. And I'm like, I never want to watch <laughs> porn with my dad. Okay? <laughs> and he's like, okay. <laughs> like, I guess you're crazy. <laughs> you know what I'm like, uh, yeah, dude. So, you know, there's those things where sometimes yeah. you have to, you know, drop the hammer. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what, what led you to the acting, man? Um, how did that happen? Well, you know, I dropped out of school. I went to Michigan. And Michigan that, State? No, University. Come on, man. University of Michigan. That's brother, a good one, on. right? That's the good one. Yeah. Not a good one. Yeah. In Michigan, that's the school. So yeah. went there, dropped out my freshman year. I always played really shitty guitar. Oh, yeah? Always, yeah. Tons of songs, really bad. You still play? I do. Yeah. I do, badly. I mean, now I have all the guitars of my dreams, like every other. <laughs> I try not to get, I get, bag. I try to get them for free, and I don't go crazy. I did I spend was, some money on some amps. Yeah, I've done all that. Yeah. Um, Got a little money. You're like, I'm buying them all. Right. I'd like the Marshall. Yeah, of course. I never, I never. Did you buy a uh, Hendrix Strat? No, because I always thought that was sac sacrilegious. Oh, yeah. I can't play like Hendrix, man. Right. I mean. So what's your guitar? Right now I'm into Les Pauls. And yeah, I was me too. very late to Me the too. Game. Me To Gibsons, late. I was always no. a Fender guy. Mm hmm And now Absolutely. I got a couple Gibsons and I'm like, holy shit, these are magic. Uh, yeah. They really are. I mean, yeah. that, that guitar can do everything oh yeah yeah what what kind which last fall you got i have a <clears throat> well what happened was you know my f one of my first guitars was like a 73 les paul deluxe yeah the gold top no it was a cherry red uh-huh you, you could buy like three hundred dollars yeah you know and I, I customized it and all this sure. it was stolen like uh -huh. every <laughs> yeah, guitar yeah. ever yeah so I, I, I lend mine and then they disappear like I know who had them and where they went, <sighs> no. but then you can't get them back. No, it yeah. usually went like, David, David, did Tommy's mom tell you to call me? Yeah, mom, what's going on? All right, I just don't want you to be upset, mom. What's going on, <laughs> son? Sit down. And um, I was like, mom, what happened? Well, I came home from school, yeah. and I asked you to put the dishes in the sink. I was like, mom, what? She goes, there's been a break in. <laughs> Right. Like, oh my God, Mom, go in my closet and look. Well, I have to put the groceries down. Uh -huh. You know, she's there and I'll call you back. Uh, there's no guitar. Yeah. So the guitar was stolen. Uh huh. She gave me money. And yeah. I bought another one. That's when I bought the Les Paul. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to replace that guitar. Right. Nostalgia. And I started looking around and playing. And I'd also had a big theft, you know, here in California. I had a bunch of very valuable vintage guitars that were stolen yeah and i just was done i'm yeah. done with old crusty yeah vintage yeah. i just want something that sounds good yeah. and i can replace sure so. yeah i think i never got into that like i got some amps that are kind of classic but i won't do the i can't collect it i got a lot of guitars but i try to talk them out of the guys yeah. like hey i'll talk about them on the thing i'll play them on the show yeah i'll play them on the show you give me and i'll do the thing and it takes a couple of years, and eventually they yes. relent. And they give Motorcycles, me I did that with. But yeah. the guitars, I just, you know, most of my life, trading albums, selling albums, like in the 70s. I'm when still I was, doing that. Well, that was my currency. I mean, when I was in college, I lived above a used record shop. So whenever I was out of money, I would just go and trade uh, albums. Because yeah. that was instant cash. The same with guitars. I always... Uh, bought yeah. really great vintage guitars when I was broke. I would sell them or, you know, do whatever. I never hocked them. I just sold them and it was like, okay, well. You I back into records? I have a core, not currently, but I got into comedy albums, like the old like yeah. black comedy albums. Sure. The best. You yeah. Know, Blue yeah. Fly and, yeah. and Red Fox. The party and, records? Yeah. Yeah, those are great. Yeah. Yeah. So that was probably my last run. Yeah. Why yeah, I'm just start? I'm just back into it. I'm in the rabbit hole with the records. Hey man. Yeah. Get it. So all right, so you drop out of Michigan. Yeah, so I went to New York. I was reading Cream magazine sure. and Soho Weekly, Village Voice, and right then was the punk scene. I was like the Ramones and Patty Smith and all those. Seventy two, seventy three? Yeah, seventy four. Uh huh. And I just felt like if I don't go at this moment, then I'm gonna miss it. And also 
I looked upon it. Of course, I didn't tell my mom. This, yeah. But this is my year abroad. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <clears throat> so I just took my money and yeah. just, what, what, really I took the tuition money and moved to New York City. You know, the Lower East Side, 75. Yeah. I lived there for a year. Oh, yeah. And at that time is when I started hanging out with actors in New York. And I figured this is what I can do with my life. Because I really said, look, you, you, you suck at guitar. What's the best? You know, you get an album, <laughs> yeah. a bald spot, and you're fucked. You're fucked yeah. in like nine years. You're yeah. pot belly. You know, do acting. You can get old doing it. <laughs> really? You thought that you were yes. you're thinking the long term. Yeah, because I was already jaded. I mean, I was already, you know, by the 70s, all those groups, I'd seen everybody and Led Zeppelin, all that stuff. And yeah, but on some level, it's sort of like what you said about your old man and about like, uh, you know, getting into a business. Yes, yes. That you could yes. call your own. Just, that, but you at least acknowledged your talent to some degree. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know if I had talent yet. So you're hanging out with actors, and what do you? How do you proceed? Um, here's what happened. I'm yeah. going to tell you this. So I worked at the the Hagen Dazs Ice Cream Store. It was on 86th Street, like the it, original one or something. Like, no, but back at that time in the 70s, Hagen Dazs. Yes, yeah. Hagen Dazs. You could only there were only two stores right. in the world. Yeah, where you could. <laughs> this guy who owned these two stores that you could walk in yeah. and get a cone. Back then, Hagen Dazs ice cream was like exotic. Yeah, sure. You know, and people would line up. Yeah. and you would scoop until you had carpal tunnel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's what I was doing. Yeah, a guy comes in and I was just tired. I was yeah. tired. It was the end of the night yeah. and he asked me something. I got up on the counter and I did this whole routine and yeah. I jumped down. The guy was like, I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> you are an actor and you are wasting your life. Now, you don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not some pervert. Yeah. I'm going to give you this card. This is an agent. You need to go and call this person and uh, it's your life, but this is what I feel you were destined to do. It, 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 this really happened. Yeah. So I said, okay. And that's what started it. That's what started it. You yeah. called the guy? Yes. I went to this agent, and they were legitimate. And they were saying, like, look, you really need some training. I mean, yeah. you've got to get into scene study. And so then I applied to the neighborhood playhouse. Uh huh. Sanford Meisner. Sanford Meisner, right. Sat there and interviewed me. But, you know, at the time I was like, yeah, some old white guy. Yeah, right. weird. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And he interviewed me like we talked for like over an hour and he said, you know what? I like you a lot. I'll yeah. let you in. But then I had to raise like the money to go there. My mother would never pay for it. So that led me to go back to Michigan, start acting there and then move back to New York. I mean, it just seemed like the logical thing. You went back to school? Yes. And I said, because then I can, you know, I knew that my I would have the support of my family. Right. My friends. As long as you were in college and they could think exactly. like, he won't stick with this. Yes. That was it. Because yeah. I never majored in acting. Right. I majored in journalism. She's like, well, okay, I'm a Negro reporter. That's <laughs> acceptable. By the way, David, <laughs> something's happened. What, mom? We had another break in. What? <laughs> there were like five break-ins when I was in there, like every yeah. week. Yeah. <laughs> Another guitar. Oh, they took everything. Yeah. They, yeah. So they. you finish Michigan. Yeah, I, I, I finished Michigan, and at that point, I, you know, I was majoring in, in journalism. But, but you're I, acting like in the stage troupe thing? Everything. The, in, in everything. In college or yes. outside of college? Oh, okay. We formed our own theater company uh i was full on you know, yeah. i was like this is what i'm gonna do but not training really just yeah doing it. i mean i was studying acting that's where really i took classes i just couldn't major major right. in it at and, the school uh, yes mm -hmm. and uh then i applied to yale got in holy My shit. roommate who's reg e kathy people know because he's pretty pretty well known i guess yeah I mean, um we both got in yeah and then I went from Yale. It was like that was two years at it. Yale or four, three, three years at Yale. So that three. was, and that's the preeminent acting program at that time. Meryl Streep went there. And like started. Juilliard and Yale was it? Yeah, I applied to Juilliard, and they're like, "No, thank you, sir." But Yale was big, right? So it was huge, man. So you had to do the whole thing. You had to do movement. You had to do dance. Oh, you had to do fencing. swordsmanship. Yeah, fencing, fencing ballroom, Alexander <laughs> technique. <laughs> we did. We didn't do ballroom, but we did do. Yeah, some phonetics. We had phonetics, and we had speed. It was like you know the MGM, you know. But you were, who was in your there. class? Were there people? People that went there with me around yeah. that, you know, Rock Dutton I met there. Yeah. Um, Kate Burton, Jane Kaczmarek, Jane Kaczmarek, John Turturro, you know, some people like that. You know him? Yes. We were all were in school there. Yeah. He, like, he, like, that's, that's sort of, that must have been amazing. 
It was amazing. It you was know, amazing. Because there's like, if you go to Yale, that's all you're doing because New Haven's a shithole. Exactly. Right. <laughs> it was like going to school in Detroit, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but on the serious side, because it was only all about art. That's all we did. Right. 24 Theater. 7. And you didn't have the pressure of your career. Right. Didn't have the pressure of, well, you were just in this, you know, Strindberg one act. How is that going to affect your TVQ? No, we were just doing the work. Well, at that, in those years that, you know, a career was not the focus. Like they they didn't be, you know, there wasn't as many options. It was a long shot Mm -hmm. and you got into it to do theater. Like, you know, oh, yeah. You, so I was bought in. I was just cult fit. So you do it. You were doing all. You were doing Schrimberg. You were doing Shakespeare. All of it. Yeah. All of <laughs> it. And I, I in particular, for some reason, I did like thirty three productions in three years. I mean, a million and all different kind of stuff. It really changed my life. And we would do. You know, we. I started doing comedy. Like we would do. I think we did this uh, evening of comedy. You know, at and, Yale. Yes, yes. That in the cabaret. <laughs> And I would sing. I still wrote songs, and I would go to New York and do workshops. Or, or, but at that point, those people I knew, like one of the guys, I guess that I met while there, like Steve Forbert, yeah, who be, who became kind of the cool singer. For a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. We him. were all we would all do open mics, yeah, and all that kind of stuff. But and, anyway, that's and what you I were did. doing singing or doing stand up. No, I never did stand up when I was in New York. I was uh, I was a musician. How right. dare you? A did musician you? and actor. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and then I tried comedy, which was, you know. What? Nothing. I lived around the block from the Catch? Catch a Rising Star. In the seventies. Well, that was actually I moved after I graduated. I moved back to New York, yeah. and that was my apartment. And yeah, you know, that's where I met Chris Rock. I mean, a bunch of people. Late seventies. <clears throat> yes, eighty actually. 80. Eighty-one. Yeah, eighty-one. So you graduate Yale, having mm-hmm. done like you know everything from you know Shakespeare to David Rabe to Beckett. To, yeah. yeah, and then w- your first couple, you get movies pretty quick, right? No, I mean my first job was to star in a musical on Broadway about Jackie Robinson, the first African American. Ball player. Now yeah. here's how it went down. Like you know, my my mom. What was came. it called? It was called the first. Yeah. And on my graduation, my dad came, and this was the f- one time where yeah. he was speechless. Oh know, yeah, man? that's good. Like he's walking around and, after the show. No, this is the graduation okay. day. Oh, okay. And he's yeah. like, yeah, he's like, how did you do this? <laughs> like he was so disconnected. He was like. You know, well, so you want to join the circus? When did this start? <laughs> and I was like, uh, well, it's a passion. And he was totally blown away. You know? uh, and I just was like, God, please. Yeah. Please give me one job. I will become a male hustler. Please <laughs> just let them feel I have something. Well, and but, like magic. But I he was impressed, job. though. Fuck yeah, he was speechless. <laughs> yeah. And I went, oh my God, it was just a great feeling. When you yeah. got the job and you could tell him. And- well, no, first of all, that day. Yeah. And I literally made that prayer. I said, please give me one job. I'll be unemployed for 10 years just right. to shut them up. And I got this role. Yeah. It was to the star in this musical. Plus it was like acting, you know, it was about yeah. black people, white people, you know. I sang songs like, and mama, I can play that game. Son, it's not your time. You know, that kind of stuff. I can climb that tree. You know, that kind of stuff. And so my dad came, everybody came and I was like, thank, thank you. Yeah. And my mom freaked the fuck out. She would, she just went nuts. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, that's my son. And you know. It was cool. I mean, it's cool if you've had that moment. I know not everybody does, but it was sometimes cool. it takes a long time, if at all, for them to realize, yeah. like, oh, I guess he's doing something. I always hated you. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I got that. Yeah. So it really was. But I'll tell you one time, like, so when we closed, you know, we only ran for three weeks. We closed and my the world mom, wasn't ready. I don't know. It just, yeah, yeah. Man, it just flopped. Yeah. It just flopped. Real good hearted. I mean, you know, at that time, people would come from Brooklyn. Sure. It was all about the Dodgers. They yeah, would sit they remember. There and they would cry. I mean, the, the scrim, our uh, curtain, uh-huh. was the old fence from Ebbets Field. They recreated it. What was the audience? Was it was it mixed or was it? It was papered. Is right. <laughs> it was because I remember one of the last performances again, me, in the clouds. I go, I think we're going to make it. You know, and they're like, look, the, 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 it's almost a full house. And like the stage manager goes, kid, that's your cue. And I go, yeah, yeah, but w- w- come on. He goes, the, the audience is papered. I said, what does papered mean? <laughs> There's Jackie now. And I had to run on stage. 
<laughs> and I'm like, oh, God, now I even know. But uh, it was amazing. It was like I was on cloud nine. It must have been so exciting to be on a big stage. And who cares if it's papered? I mean, no, be on I Broadway. Mean, that yeah. was the end. Literally, for that period, everything I could have dreamt in my life Came true. Yeah. And the last day when we were yeah. closing, I had never gone through this. And I, I remember I got in a cab and I yeah. said, take me around the park. And the guy rode me around the park and I yeah. just like bawled like a kid. You know, oh. I was like, it's, and I come into the theater and everyone's crying. Everyone, like these are old, hardened crew members yeah. were weeping, yeah. you know, and it just, because they were killed me. attached to the show. They thought it was a great yeah, show. Yeah, they believe. I mean, it was a sweet show. It was a very New York show. Yeah. And, and it was because what really what the play was about, if there's a great documentary about the Dodgers, because yeah. this was a time in New York where they got it right. You know, and, and Ebbets Field, this cross section of Brooklyn, these are baseball players who lived in the community because mm -hmm. they didn't make that much money. Yeah. When they were not uh, training, they worked at like the appliance shop, right? Or at a car dealership, yeah. Uh, so they were in the community, and uh, it was a very special time, yeah. So it was, it was great. I it think you should special. revive it. I, only if I can play him now. Yeah. There's young Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> you come like, I got, I'm, a, I'm a little older. <laughs> well, I'm kind of stiff, boys. <laughs> you know, I've been married three times. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> He's 22. <laughs> if Jackie had lived. <laughs> but, you know, how long uh, did he live? Uh, uh, he, li uh, sadly, once he retired, it's like his body fell apart. I mean, oh. he developed diabetes, oh, right. which he died in his 50s, really. Oh. But so, the uh, the connection was that most African Americans who excelled, yeah. like, during that period, kind of like my dad, you had to be super ex exceptional. I yeah. mean, Jackie Robinson got a letter, lettered in, like, three different sports. Right. He could have become an Olympic athlete. Right. A baseball player, a football player, you know, basketball player, anything. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. You couldn't coast. You couldn't, you know, take anything for granted because you had to, you know, not only make the cut, you had to be above it. Man, yeah. So you, you no one could like, argue it. Uh-uh. You had to be like, I'm going to take these white people and let them know. <laughs> you <laughs> right. couldn't be like, uh-uh. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, it was wild. It was wild. People. And then when did the movie start? Well, after the musical you know i was nominated for a tony that year which was you know it brought me into the the community the world you know, the yeah acting professional yeah. acting i did a show called soldiers play at the negro ensemble and we all i think my first film was streamers with robert altman that's heavy man yeah man it was that was again it was like it's a heavy play are you kidding me god damn i'll tell you like david rabe right i i met him at this place where yeah we all used to hang out, and I go, "Hey, man, David, it's me, David Allen Greer. I'm a young Negro actor, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be in your play. But we're doing a movie." He goes, "I know." I'm like, "Okay." It's right. kind of weird attitude. <laughs> I go, I'm so excited. He said, "You better not fuck it up." And I was like, "Okay, I'm going to go sit over here now." <laughs> he scared the shit out of me. But I saw him afterwards, and he liked it. So yeah, that was good. There's some heavy monologues in that play. Hey, man. And Robert Altman, man, yeah. come on. It was, again, it was just... That was that period where Altman was shooting those plays. Like yeah, When you come back to the Five and Dime streamers, and he did... Uh, there was another Super one. Super 16 is what it was called. And, of course, people laughed at him, you know, because I remember I would go into, like, real big movies, and they'd yeah. be like, I see you did streamers. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. I remember this one well-known director, and he goes, yeah, did you shoot on that Super 16? <laughs> All right, go ahead and read. Yeah. You know. Well, what was Alvin like at that point? He was so great. I mean, he taught me about movie making. Yeah. Because, first of all, the dailies. Yeah. That's all the footage you shot that day. Yeah. Um, the director and everybody, they have to watch everything to choose the takes. Yeah. And it was a completely open process. You know, uh, that's where Altman was. He said, look, I'm not going to hide anything from you. I encourage you actors to come and see this work because he wanted us to buy into the process. Yeah. I want you to care about what we're so, doing. Right, you're going to so, learn. Right. So the next day you're like, yes. hey, we know what's up. Exactly. And maybe I should tone it down. Yeah. Right. You know? Oh, right. 
all that. And yeah. so uh, we went. We went every night. And there, was, there was like a little bar in the back, and we would all watch. And, and I learned so much on that movie. Wow. And so he did what well, didn't over-direct. Yeah. I mean, he told me several times. He's like, you know, my biggest job is casting. So one of the things when we auditioned is we would read through the whole play, which yeah. is at his apartment. He had this place on Central Park. And he would switch people out. But, I mean, you stay there. You read the whole first act or the whole entire play. Yeah. And that's, you know, I never have since had a audition process. Like right. That, you know? Well, I, I, I talked to a lot of directors, and it turns out, like, a lot of them, you know, it's really like, I cast you. Do what, do what I hired you to do. Yes. I already <laughs> believe in you. Yeah, exactly. You know? But uh, so so it was great. It was uh, a real great learning process. Also, it demystified it because before that film, I didn't know how you got a film. I was like, well, maybe I'm not doing it right. Yeah. You know, maybe I need to, you know, act. Film acting is different because this is what we were always told. You know? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of stops and starts. You can't get a groove going, yeah. really. Action cut. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's lunch. Yeah. You know, but uh, so I, I didn't know the process and it was really great. And you went from there to Soldier Story? Yeah, that and that was another. That was uh, Jewison. Was it Norman, Norman Jewison? Jewison. And 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 that was. I remember that movie. That that movie is is a devastating movie. It is. I mean, I'd been in the play, and uh, it was called the Soldiers' Play at that time. Yes, yeah. and you know Sam Jackson was in there. Oh, really? But his role was cut out of the movie. You uh huh. Know? And um, and for, for like a few years, because I was rolling, you know, Denzel Washington, who was a friend. We were all like, it's like, poor Sam. You think he'll ever get it together? I don't know. He's really tall and weird. Anyway. yeah, and like, he's, He did all right. Yeah, he's fine. I mean, he just blew the fuck up. And That's right. Great. Denzel was in that, too. Yep. Guy, you know, the Washington. two I get confused. What's the other one? The Civil War one. Well, all the black people. Yeah. No yeah. yeah. Oh, you mean uh, Glory? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he was great in Glory. Ooh, man. Oh, man. Oh, this is another... So I read for Glory, yeah. but at the time, the guys who directed it, the guy yeah. who directed it also had 30-something on uh -huh. the air, which I loved. And I was like, listen, I don't really want to play a slave, but yeah. I'd love to do 30-something. That's what it is. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So I was like, yeah, David, you're playing J-Bo. All right, go. I was like, you came. I got to. <laughs> you're like, thank you for coming in. And I get in the car like, I think I really got his ear <laughs> on the 30-something. Yeah, again, I was wrong. And you got to play J-Bo on 30-something. No, I didn't. Yes, of course. I got nothing is what I got. I got the call where your agents go, what happened today? I, but, I think it was pretty good. I yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the fascinating thing about like your career is that all whatever you did as an actor like leading up to it, you have a very sort of varied actor's career. I mean, you've done fucking everything. But I mean, I always wanted to do it like that. Yeah, but it's amazing because not everybody gets to do it like that. You've never stopped mm -hmm. working, and you know that you took opportunities bro. where you could. And the the opportunity that makes you is like you're already three or four or five movies into whatever mm -hmm. when In Living Color happens, right? Wow. But dig that year that you know we had done. Uh, I'm gonna get you, sucker. Yeah. Now, first of all, I got a rule with back. the weigh-ins. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's where when I did uh, Soldier's Story, yeah. I shared a honey wagon or you know like yeah. a little dressing room yeah. with Robert Townsend. Yeah. Robert Townsend would do these routines, and I'm like, this is the funniest dude I have ever seen in my life. And yeah. he'd go, I'd be like, is this your act? And I remember said, watching him on stage at the Comedy Store. Yeah. The improv. And yeah. he said, but Robert would go. He go, no, that's my act. That's my boy's act, Damon. He was doing Mo Money. <laughs> He would do he would do a sprinkle of Keenan stuff and I'm like, oh, who are these people? Yeah, and I need to meet them. So he mm -hmm. introduced me to the Wands, and I would hang out in comedy clubs with them. Once I yeah. moved out, that's what I did every it was night. So interesting those two guys as comedians because like when I was a doorman at the comedy store in like mm -hmm. eighty what, whatever the fuck it was eighty seven like Damon had not broke huge so mm -hmm. he was still doing stand up and it was un like one <laughs> I would sit there in the main room doing the door. And like uh, I said, well, are you gonna do the, you, that thing tonight? He's like, no, tonight's gonna be jazz set. Hey and man, he <laughs> hey, him and him and him and Jim Carrey would talk about. Do you remember that time I, I got in the piano and I stayed there for an hour and a half? And I was like, that must have been uncomfortable. What? I don't get it. Where was the punchline? Right. It didn't Could matter. people hear you? Yeah. You know, they were like, no, David. Keenan was just straight up stand up. Yes. Totally like, and, and Damon was like out there. Well, and Keenan. Keenan was like, hear the jokes. He was in, when we were doing Soldier Story, 
uh, he Keenan was in the centerfold of Right On magazine, uh-huh. you know, with a shirt, <laughs> yeah. no shirt on. Right, like, right, hey, yeah. what's up? Yeah. You know, <laughs> laying this dick on all of y'all. And I was like, fuck, man, that's huge. Yeah. I remember we saw him on The Tonight Show uh-huh. in our motel in Arkansas, right. you know, and yeah. I remember the bit. He would do this bit like how the last person that got on the train Subway train, as the, as the doors closed, it was like watching a baby being born. And he would physically do it. It was hilarious. And I'm like, this guy's a genius, too. There's something in their family. <laughs> so, long story short, I would hang out with those guys. Yeah. And it was just by osmosis. They said, look, you have to get on stage if you're going to be here. And it was more like a dare. Yeah. So, you know, I just started, uh, for fun, Yeah. doing spots. and At that, the improv? No, I, I chose uh, the Laugh Factory because... It was a black hole. Nobody. I remember that. It was like a hallway. Yes. It was, Nobody it was would go in next there. Next to that old Chinese restaurant that mm-hmm. closed. It was like, I remember that because I was at the doorman at the comedy store in the mid 80s and you go to the Laugh Factory and it's just like you'd walk in the door and you were in the room. Yes. And in order to go to the bathroom, you had to walk down the right uh, side to that door and oh, the guy yeah. would be on stage right there. Oh, and yeah. and anytime you went there, Paul Mooney was on stage. Well, <laughs> and, exactly and, right. And Frazier Smith. It was Frazier exactly Smith right. and Paul Mooney. You're exactly right. And Paul Mooney, this is when Paul Mooney was firing. Just sure. Brilliant. Yeah. I just felt like I could work out at the Laugh Factory. Yeah. I always hated the comedy store. I was always intimidated. Hated the improv. Yeah. Too much uh, pressure. It was too much. Yeah. yeah. It was too much. And um, so that's where I started. Yeah. And from there, I, I remember standing in line. I'd done the pilot yeah. to In Living Color. So you could only do it once a month. So the next month, In Living Color had come on, and I'd done like- Do what once a month? Like the open mic, whatever their policy was at that time. You oh, you had to them. follow the policy? Yeah, because I wasn't anybody. <laughs> right, right. I was just uh, the there. policy of the Laugh Factory, like Jamie Masada, who was working the register. Yes, and the wa- door. Yeah, Nobody, wa- no, 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 yeah, no. When you walked in, you just this mean Israeli dude. Oh, yeah. yeah You'd be like, you were just here last week. No, brother. No, brother. <laughs> And I'm like, what? What are you kidding me? There's like 40 seats in the place. Oh yeah, (laughs) but I remember the Wayans, all those guys. When I would do spots, they would. I have it on tape. Yeah, do it again. Your premise, you too long with the premise, man. Come on, they would like tell me while you were on stage. While I'm trying to do these (laughs) bits, and my bits were one act plays. Yeah, okay, because that's where I came. Yeah, as the gentleman entered the bar, it's like shut up. (laughs) So, any rate, uh. The deal was, I come back a month later, yeah. in Living Color was on, my three national commercials, and these homeless comedians were like, what the fuck happened? He did one spot, and this guy blew up. And I never, I could never bring myself to say, look, dude, I had a career. Okay? Yeah. I, you know. So that's what they thought. That's interesting because, like, com- comedians, it's sort of like they their trajectory is what it is. You know, you yes. hammer it out, then you get the break on the Tonight Show, then mm. maybe you get a deal to do a show. Here you're you're at Yale, you're doing Jackie Robinson, you did movies, you did TV shows, you got commercials, you went the whole other way, and then you show up in Comedy Land, mm. and they're like, "Who the fuck is this guy oh. to get this shit?" Yeah, the guy's an open micer. Yeah, right. Uh. That's exactly what happened. I remember I did a spot at the Comedy Store. And they were like, this dude's funny. Yeah. They grabbed Mitzi. Yeah. They said, do you, they brought me to the main room. Said, what did she like? say? Well, she was back there. And like one of my big jokes was like, Detroit police, yeah. bang, freeze. And she goes, that's Mike Binder's joke. Uh, he's from Detroit. He's from you Detroit. stole it. And I was like, Mike who? <laughs> he's like, you're a thief. But uh-huh. she said, keep working yeah. and uh, come back. You know, you're a thief, but I like you. No, she said, you know, that, that's that's his joke. But she she was encouraging. But I, that room was, it was too much. The original room? The little one? Yes. yes. yes it's heavy, dude. It is. It's the, it, it, like, it takes a while to get comfortable there. And if you never get comfortable there, you'll never be comfortable there. Like, yeah, you I can mean, go, let you go in there tonight and feel that shit. I probably could. I mean, I performed there several times, yeah. you know, at, back in that period. And they were, they said, come by any time. That just wasn't my room as yeah. a comic. You know what I mean? Yeah. That just wasn't the place yeah. where I could, Laugh Factory was that place. Oh, right. It's a little, uh, it's a little looser there. You feel like it's a, like you got less to lose for some reason. I could just stretch out. Yeah. And you know, back in the day, we would do like, I remember we'd get, I'd get in a car, rent a wreck. Yeah. Oh, I'd rent do a wreck. as many spots as I could, four or five spots. Uh, in prepare in preparing for living color ish no, or just this was it? just because once I got into it, right, you, you got to prove yourself. Right, it was yeah. just obsessive, and I would record every set, yeah. and they all sound the same. Yeah, 
one people I would kill, one audience. Yeah. The next, same energy, same. Yeah. It was just crickets. Yeah. And finally, I just stopped recording myself because it taught me nothing. It yeah, I, just... I, I record and then I don't listen. That's my game. Well, I would be like, <laughs> I have guys, have you ever eaten popcorn? And you know, the, on cheese doodles, the dust gets on your fingers. Yeah. I'm like, you suck. Yeah. You know? yeah. And like the next, they're like screaming, hollering. And I'm like, why? I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, uh, you, you can't figure out the magic. No. So then how did the show come to be? Um, was it, it was on the air before you started on no, it? No, no. We done... Uh, you were I'm there at the beginning, you, right? Yeah, we yeah. done I'm Gonna Get You Sucker. And, you know, when Eddie Murphy first popped... Wait, is that I'm Gonna Get You Sucker? Is that Robert's or the Wayans movie? It, it was, was supposed to be both of them. What but, was Robert's first movie called? Uh, the one with the credit? Hollywood Shuffle. Oh, okay, that's it. Okay, okay. Got yeah, it. Hollywood yeah, yeah, Shuffle. Yeah. So I'd come out to do a pilot. I did this show for the Charles Brothers, NBC. Um, it was called All is Forgiven. Yeah. Like in 86 or something. Right. First television show. Uh, anyway, in Living Color, everyone talked about doing, we should do, someone should do a black SNL. Yeah. They should do a black Saturday Night Live. Right. Eddie Murphy talked about doing it, never came to fruition. So Keenan just took up the mantle. He is the first one to actually do it. Like, he got this opportunity, and he said, we're going to do the sketch show. Yeah. And he called me up, and he said, I want people to know how funny you are. You know, yeah, because he'd seen me yeah. from the very and right. hanging out with those guys. Robert at that time was my best friend. We hung out with the, each other all night. How's he doing night. now? I don't talk to him. Mm. But the point is, <laughs> I don't know. I, don't, I haven't seen him a, I a long time. Seen him either. I don't know where he is, but yeah. I know he and Keenan are still oh, good. tight. But so that was what it was. He said, uh, "I think you should do this." And it was in a year where I must have auditioned for thirty pilots. Uh huh. And after years of trying to control the narrative, meaning, yeah. you know, Stephen Boschko is doing a singing basement. Yeah. <laughs> I can yeah. guarantee you, David, <laughs> much like the <laughs> Deaf Theater's production of Othello, yeah. this is going to kill. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. You know, I just did <laughs> In Living Color for fun because yeah. my friends were in it. Yeah. They, weren't, they didn't pay us any money that yeah. first year. My agents did not want me to do it. Yeah. So I turned it down. Yeah. And Kim Wayans called me. I moved back to New York in my old apartment, and she called me, and she talked me down. She said, you've got to come back out. You have to do this show. I'm telling you, it'll change your life. And I listened to her. That's why. And it did. It absolutely did. There's a lot of episodes, dude. A lot of characters. A lot of... You know, and you're yeah. everybody looked like they were having so much fucking fun, and wow. there's some weird shit going on. Well, I remember... We had this long table. Yeah. So we'd come in in the morning and we'd have breakfast. And we were comics. We were young. We didn't give a shit. Mm -hmm. And it was all about making each other laugh. So yeah. that was where I saw Fire Marshal Bill. That's where half the characters came there. And yeah. if you made each other laugh, like by the second or third day, you'd be like, Mark, you got to do that. You got to yeah. do the radio guy. You yeah, have yeah. to do it. Yeah. And you're like, okay. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah. that's how it happened. It was very organic. There was no, I think I know what our audience, 15 right. to 20. No, you didn't have any executive heat on you? No. And, and it's to Keenan's credit that yeah. we were protected. Uh, we never felt that pressure. He just said, do whatever you want. And then, you know, it was like, you know, you can't do the talking butthole or whatever. Yeah. They would just say, you know, within parameters, yeah. and we just go and do it. I mean, any encouragers, you said, don't wait for the writers. Yeah. You yeah. guys have to write for yourself. And yeah. Like, Is he serious? <laughs> you know, but it was. And then you, awesome. I guess you, you probably made a, built alliances with certain cast members that you work better with. Like well, you and Damon did a lot. Yeah. But, you know, Damon, um, I remember he came to the dressing room early on. He said, look, man. Because uh, he was a writer also, yeah. and he wrote with me, he wrote Calhoun Tubbs. He said, look, you need a character, David. And I was like, yeah, but, you know, doing announcing and, <laughs> and bit parts and other people's uh, sketches is working out. He's yeah. like, no, you have to have a signature character. Yeah. So I told him about this guitar guy. Yeah. Like I told you, I love playing guitar. Yeah. And we wrote it right in the dressing room. He says, cool, put this on. And I was Calhoun Tubbs. <laughs> yeah. And that's what started, you know, started it rolling. And right. Because I, I never wanted to be... That's not my nature. I'd never wanted to be on an SNL thing because basically you're crabs in a barrel. Yeah. You know, I've hosted it twice. And if you don't get, there's so much pressure. If you don't get on as a writer, they're going to fucking fire me. Yeah. I need you. You know, when you come in as a guest host, there's a guy in the back office. He's like, please do this avocado sketch, man. <laughs> 
I got kids. And, yeah, man, it is a death sentence. And you're like, yo, man, that shit's not funny. I'm sorry, yeah. I can't. And he's like, oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I didn't want to be in that situation. But in right. Living Color, wasn't that. Right. There was competition. Sure, but it was healthy. Exactly. Uh, it was, it was he, healthy. Made, he made everyone made each other better. Theoretically, yes. well, yeah. Well, I mean, yes. if you didn't have the heat and the pressure from the outside, oh, it from was the... brutal too. It was brutal. I mean, because we would laugh. Yeah, we, nothing made us happier. Yeah. than when someone sketch bombed. Of Jim course, Carrey. That's, that's the comics laugh. Oh, of course, the, the laugh, you, the, the singular laugh at the back of the room. It's you like, ah. Oh, well, the way is, no one has a more obnoxious laugh than them. If you've oh, ever yeah. been. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no one laughs like that. <laughs> it was just an acknowledgement. It was punctuating your failure. Yes. It was doing. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that one, yeah. So Jim did, it was called the, what was it called? The Diplomat or something? And he played, you know, this overwrought French diplomat with this big mustache. Yeah. And, I, you know, me and Tommy, I mean, we're, we're in the sketch. We get killed and we're yeah. behind the furniture. And we can feel driplets of sweat hitting us. I mean, yeah. we look up, Jim's just like fucking sweating. <laughs> the audience is like, what the fuck is this? And we were crying. <laughs> We were crying. I mean, our bodies are like, <laughs> like I am the diplomat. You know, nothing, <laughs> nothing but cricket. We fucking loved it. It's oh, the, yeah. It's oh, the yeah. best. You don't see enough of that anymore. No. The camaraderie of enjoying the failure. Yes. When you die. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's become, sur- I don't know what happened to that, but man, back in the day in comedy clubs, you'd see people losing their shit. Yeah. You know, on stage. Well, I'll tell you what happened is the dude from Seinfeld, man. I mean, you record that. Yeah. You know, I guess that, well, that's true. That's true. But like, there's still like, it's weird. Like, yeah, if you're at a certain celebrity status where mm-hmm. people know that this is going to be something like, you know, I'm still under the radar and, you know, there's plenty of us who are still under the radar where there's not like, oh, I'm going to get him. He shouldn't be saying that, right. you know, it, but you're right. It, there is a, a, a constant, uh, Sort it's of pred- predatory now. surveillance, a predatory gotcha. tabloid surveillance. Yeah. Like when Trace, Tracy Morgan. Ugh got you know all the controversy about his yeah, jokes yeah. And, and the homophobic stuff i was like have you heard the rest of his act <laughs> I mean, they're like, and then finally i think someone reviewed it on the time in the times yeah. you know when he came back and they're like yes this was offensive so was everything <laughs> yeah so, exactly like, yeah that's what he does yeah and, but and- also comedy clubs it used to be like yeah, i remember when chris zone. rock yeah chris rock was trying new jokes at in like uh, at the comedy cellar, and he got reviewed in the Times. It's like fuck that. Yeah, come on, man. It's right. That, that used to be our place. That's a, back when I, you know, when I first got back to L.A., no one was going to the comedy store. It was this dark hole. Yeah. And you're and part of me was sort of like, good. Now right. I can just go get some shit done. You right. know, take some chances. But now I like, loved your bit about fucking and eating the baby. That was brilliant. <laughs> what? Well, who shut you down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why aren't you doing that anymore? <laughs> well, <we're, laughs> This is a comic moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was at the uh, Montreal, and I run into Kevin Hart. You know, it's 2010. This is before Kevin Hart became big. Be- became big, the big. king of the universe? Exactly. Yeah, he yeah. said, man, what's going on, Dave? I was like, man, I'm going through a divorce. divorce. He said, man, sit down. Everybody's going through a divorce. He said, how are you doing? I said, I'm good now. I don't want my ex-wife to die, but I do want her to get cancer or the pussy. <laughs> and he fell out. He was like, you have got to talk about that on stage. I'm like, what are you, nuts? I have a daughter. <laughs> She's going to fucking sue me. What do you No, I can't talk about that on stage. You know? And he didn't do it? No, I can't. I can't. I can't look my daughter in the Why did you talk about mommy's vagina? <laughs> Daddy was angry. It was a joke. It was yeah, a joke. Was... You got to learn sometimes jokes yeah, though. They just look at it. you like, "What? How old is she?" She's 9. Oh, okay. And still though, I remember I showed her something that was really funny to yeah, me. Yeah, she just yeah. looked at it like, like what are you, nuts? Just, they, they take it literally. Yeah, yeah. She just doesn't get it. Right. You know, she's she not will. supposed to. She will. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. But, you know, like I performed a few months ago in San Francisco, and the, the local comics, yeah. always some of the best, intelligent, most insightful comics. You yeah. know, these guys, I didn't know them. But it, it they were so paranoid that every joke was an explanation of why it's not racist you know i got on the bus and there are two black guys but i mean good looking and 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 they can do anything seriously i'm I'm, no 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 no. wait 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 no yeah and it was like dude just tell the joke (laughs) they were like you don't know what it's like i'm like i guess not (laughs) call me old school (laughs) yeah it's different it's just different but the thing that fascinated me and in, 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 was that, you know, you, you always work, you do everything that an actor does, but also a comic actor, you have a lot of range and it's beautiful. And you're working with uh, Gerard now and he's like, he's great. 
and that character is like yeah. you, you, you it's a rare fucking thing and congratulations not only to have such a a a a, a, a kind of nonstop career but then to age into a role that you can own at your age what a fucking gift you know uh I met Gerard in Montreal. Yeah. And, uh, I don't he's know. shiny. Yes. He's, he's very, very shiny. shiny. Very, he doesn't sweat. He's just. Glossy. Yeah. I don't know if he's human. He's I don't know. Well, he's a different kind of Negro. <laughs> yes, he is. A different kind of Negro. Yeah. Anyway, my, my, but my thing is, I want to be funny today. Yeah. I want to be funny right now. And I still love it. Yeah. I mean, I still love the performing. Feels good, right? Oh, fuck yeah. If I didn't it, know people would want to hear from me now. It's, and most of them don't. That's not true. But they just don't know that they do. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> no, but I mean, that's it. I mean, I want to be the older actor that I wanted to work with when I was younger. You know what I mean? Not the dude who comes in like, listen, kid, you're, you're going to suck cock if you want right, me. Right. That's what you got to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. Like, really? Yeah. No, I want to be the yeah, guy. And you can start now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I want to be that guy. There were some older actors who still had life and yeah. belief and believed in the art and the craft. That's what I want to be. But, but but I also think the fact that like you can't stop yourself from getting on a mic or getting on a stage or taking a gig. Like, you know, you did a lot of work with Corolla. You went through mm -hmm. a lot of pain and trouble with divorces in a very candid format. Mm. And, and ultimately what happens is, as some guy who is a too much information guy, is people get to know you too well. And, you know, and, and that's not a bad thing because you help a lot of people when you do that but i think that you know the idea that people don't want to hear from you is the only thing that they know you pretty fucking well i didn't count on that i didn't count i know on but that, like you know, know you're gonna get on radio and you're gonna do if you're gonna do love line and corolla they're gonna they're gonna we got a live one here he's well, he's, he's broken lot, and he's a a lot wide open <laughs> but you know what man i remember i was in a, i was in dean and deluca yeah a couple things. First of all, down on uh, on uh, back when it was, uh, it's still the, there. West Broadway, Prince. yeah, West Broadway, or whatever. Wait, I got to go back. When in Living Color was canceled, yeah, I really thought at that time, okay, I have about eighteen months where I can headline clubs yeah. and, and venues. Then that's going to go away, and then I just have to, you know, go on with my career because there was no internet, no YouTube, right. no none of that. I couldn't picture. This the yeah. technological ability to put, press a button and and collect all the favorite sketches sure. you had. So I didn't see the longevity of the show. Was not part of your job description. To no, for so, so technology. That's what I mean, yeah. I didn't. I didn't think yeah. it would be like this. But you had it. You knew how you from seeing other people do it. You knew you had a window. If you played yes, it right, which I right. did, but yeah. I didn't think at this point people would still be talking about in living color. I just didn't see it. Jim Carrey saw it. Yeah. He's because he said from the beginning, he said, what we're doing is history. And I was like, what are you nuts? Yeah, it's TV. What exactly. do you mean? history? Yeah, this, this is not history. He saw that. I mean, yeah. I didn't see that. Uh, so here but, we are. But no, but, but but the beautiful thing is, is you're doing this character. You do, you know, out, after everything you put out in the world, you've got this great character on a great uh, sitcom with a creative guys. And then you do, and now you got this gig. I don't know what this game show is, but I think at the end here we should pay some lip service to it because ostensibly is a money maker. Let me tell you something. No, I know, but I like I was going to tell you the premise, though. Oh. I like the premise. It is. It's uh, basically you just uh, it relies on your prejudices. Right. I, I think it's an interesting idea because I'm in here every fucking day with guys like you and whoever, like you know, celebrities, and I think I know something. Right. And I'm always fucking wrong. And it's sort of fascinating to me how we judge people. Yeah. Does it does does the does the show pay any uh, does it do any service to that? I mean, is there something yeah. socially relevant about the show or is no. it just it's okay. for fun? It's for fun. No, we don't sit there. There's no PBS moment. Your dad's not there going, I understand. <laughs> oh, wow. I'll put it like this. My dad was still alive when I did dancing with you know, dance yeah. with the stars. And so I got eliminated. My father yeah. he wrote me uh, an email and he said, uh, shall I mobilize the troops? Is it because <laughs> you're just too good looking and you have a Yale <laughs> education that these bastards are jealous of you? It's like, no, not really, Dad. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, it was, but it was very sweet. In yeah. these moments, I was like, my dad loves me. Yeah, you know, yeah, in a twisted, yeah. inappropriate way, but yeah. he loves me. Well, no, it's nice when you can see through, when they get to that yes. point where they get past their competitiveness mm -hmm. and their, and their own dumb pride. Yeah. To, to, you know, the, when you have a certain type of father, you got to find those moments of weakness right. where you're like, oh, he likes me. Well, you have to read way right. between the lines. And by the way, that email was not a joke. Right. He wasn't being funny. This is when you lost? Yes. Oh, he yeah. wasn't being funny. He was, I mean, he was he, absolutely. 
absolutely serious. Yeah, he was coming to your defense, so I yes, fucked him. Yeah. Clearly, this is another <laughs> another example. Bubba the white man has denied my son. <laughs> you know, and I was like, mm, pipe down, Dan. <laughs> but anyway, oh, well, good. Well, man, I you know it was great talking to you, and it was a lot of fun. I'm a big fan of the show. Oh, thank you, uh, Judd Apatow. I've yeah. listened to that interview like three or four times. Yeah, Judd used to hang around in Living Color. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. And he'd like try and give yeah. jokes. To he, sure. He he sat there going like, "I'm going to be the biggest thing in Hollywood comedy." <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, I finally did a Judd Apatow movie. I did the Big Sick. Oh yeah, know? just I talked to I saw that you were great. That was great. Well, it's a very small role. Yeah, but but it's an important role. Well, the club I, owner is the important role. The coked up club, the coked up club owner or club manager. Oh, he's not the owner. He's the club manager, right? Right. right. He's who the does dude, stand up? Yeah. Who ne isn't that in every club? Mm -hmm. Like the dude who mm -hmm. is there that no one thinks is funny, right? But they know yeah, they need him. He controls yeah, everything. Sure. Those, you know that that whole system has gotten a mm. little uh, exhausted. You know because you can sort of circumvent it now. Yeah. The, the one guy in the town that's deciding whether or not you get on stage. Yeah. Uh, but they still exist. Well, that anyway, Emily. And Gordon. you know what? They're the biggest fucking criminal. They're they're, <laughs> they're, they're, they're they're the fucking monsters. Well, they've been hacked by Russia. Oh, well, so. everybody has. But Emily Gordon, she was a writer. Yeah, she's great. On the Carmichael show. She told me she was doing a movie. I was like, great, you're a little movie. I'll do it. She was like, okay. So that's how it came about. I didn't know. Did you like the movie when you watched it? Of course. It was it's, awesome, it's, man. You know what's awesome about it is, is like you, you watch it and you're like, there's no way this was made up. You know, and it's so rare to see something translated like that. Like a very unique love story that Dude, it, the darkness is, of it is so real. The only thing they didn't capture is that. Yeah. So Emily is one of the happiest people I've ever met. Yeah. Like so joyous that I stopped her. This is how the conversation started. Why are you so fucking happy? And she goes, because everybody should be because it's an amazing day. And I'm like, no, really, cut the bullshit. Yeah. Why? And she told me the story. Well, you know, I almost died. And I'm like, you're lying. And she goes, no. I wrote a book about it and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. And she goes, yeah. And we wrote a script about it. And I'm like, what? Yeah. You know? And I was like, knee jerk. Yeah, I'll do it. She goes, really? I said, yeah, I'll do anything. So that's what happened. It's great. Yeah. It's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. You, Congratulations to them. You're a busy man and it's good. I got to go to work. You right do? Now. Where are you no, going? I'm going back home. Yeah. To just chill. Do you live nearby? I do not. Now, f I have questions. <laughs> yeah. I live in the Hollywood Hills, but what is this neighborhood? Highland Park. Highland You'll get back Park. easy. Where you can, you live in the so you can go to the 134 or something? Come yeah, around the back? Is it Glendale? No. Oh, you're close. It's sort of between Pasadena and Glendale, Highland Park. This is a hip little pocket yeah. here. Yeah, it's a nice little, uh, a nice little uh, uh, shtetl of and hipsters. How long have you been here? I've been here since 2004. Wow. And, uh, it was, you know, it's, it's a nice little neighborhood. I, mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about the neighborhood. I was driving a guy around who was looking to rent a house mm -hmm. and I saw this house for sale and I had a little deal money. I'd never bought a house before. I'm wow. like, that one seems good. And when I first moved here and I was driving to him back and forth in the comedy store, I'm like, where the fuck do I live? <laughs> <laughs> what did I do? Yeah. But now no, it's, it's like, nice, okay. man. Yeah, on. I like it. It's it is great, man. I'm glad we talked. Absolutely. Funny guy. Definitely paid his dues. Definitely deserves all the work he gets and works a lot. David Allen Greer. It was very nice having him here. Don't forget to check out Room 104, the new anthology series from creators and executive producers Mark and Jay Duplass, premiering July 28th at 11.30 p.m. on HBO. Set in a single room of an average American motel, each episode of Room 104 tells the story of different assorted characters who pass through it. With performances by James Vanderbeek, Jay Duplass, and Orlando Jones, each episode plays like a mini-movie, ranging from comedy to drama to horror. One room, infinite possibilities. Room 104 premieres July 28th at 11.30 p.m. on HBO. You can always go to WTFPod.com for all your WTF Pod needs. Seems a lot of people don't check there before they uh, tell me to have a guest on. WTFPod.com slash podcast will get you a search bar where you can search all 800 now, however many episodes. All right? You dig it? I believe I may be talking to Vice President Al Gore next week. That should be exciting and harrowing. And uh, scary, but informative. Hopefully infused with a bit of hope. Should we play some guitar? I'm set up. Everything's clean. 
Some like nice stuff, not too crazy. Probably something I've done before. Why not? Why not do it? Why not? Why not? Thank you. 